Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge, with your host, Aaron the A-Train Smith. And welcome, everybody. How you doing? It's another Tuesday here at Intersect. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, we're creeping up on Thanksgiving Day. So before uh, uh, we get started here, I just want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and thank you all for tuning in to the show and be, being so encouraging. Thank you all to all the people that have been on the show and um, thank you for the guys in the studio and, and um, just thanks all around. And today we're just going to kick it off here with my friend. Mr. Phil Cias. Phil is a, Phil is like, I'm reading his resume and I'm going, man, you, this guy's been busy. He's uh, composing <laughs> music for records and film, both movies and TV. Uh, he's got a record company and he's he's been writing with like some killer people here. You know, he... Uh, He's been writing with um, Jimmy Webb at one point. Yeah, with Jimmy Webb, yeah, really, was, really. Yeah, pretty pretty and early da- on. Yeah, yeah, and David Foster. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. nobody else. There's nobody else to write with. You know, that's that it. Those two it. guys. Are- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, yeah, pretty, Phil. Pretty Thank you, man. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank yeah, you man. for having me. Oh, yeah. You've been busy ever since you left Sacramento. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of that was in Sacramento as well. So, um, yeah, it's okay. been a wild, been a wild ride. When did you, when did you move out of Sacramento? Well, um, I was, I was born in Los Angeles and my family, we moved to Sacramento in about 1976. So, um, I was there. Yeah. Um, no, I was, I think I was 12 or 13 at the time. Yeah. And, um, my, my dad was, uh, part of the Jerry Brown administration. The first time Brown was, uh, governor Brown was governor Brown. So we moved up. Oh yeah. In uh, what capacity? uh, in what he, capacity? Um, yeah, he was the director of Department of Motor Vehicles. So he was appointed by Jerry um, for that, and uh, that brought mm-hmm. us up to Northern California. And uh, we wound up living in Davis, um, and I wound up going to Davis High and uh, really fell in love with Northern California. Um, mm-hmm. So throughout my life, been back and forth, yeah. Have you ever lived here in Nashville? No. Uh, there was a time when it was really close, uh, but I, and I took my wife, <laughs> my wife out to California or to Nashville, and we went to look. And she, um, she said, "No, she's a California girl." So she goes, "You can go yeah, there happens. as much as you want." But, That's yeah. right. That happens to uh, a lot of Californian women. They go, "Oh hell no." Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I, and I love Nashville. I mean, I would move there tomorrow, but I love my wife too. So <laughs> yeah, we're going to, we're going to stay, yeah. we're gonna stay put in California. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. I was, I was surprised to learn that you'd been here like receiving awards and nominations and I didn't know you were in town. Yeah, I, I yeah, I kind of, you know, I'm an under the radar <laughs> kind of guy. Get in, get out, you know. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, but, <laughs> that is yeah. under the radar. Oh my goodness! So I tell you what, um, I don't know much about your early child childhood life. Um, so um, 
fill us in. Just what, where were you born and how did you get started in music? Well, I was born in Eagle Rock, California. Um, so that's right in between Glendale and Pasadena. And um, mm-hmm. start, the story goes is I got into music at a very, very early age. I uh, picked up a guitar and um, my dad taught me a couple of chords and I was never to be seen again. I would stay in my bedroom, you know, listening to records and just trying to pick stuff out and, um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jackson five and Stevie wonder stuff. And, um, and, uh, so I was always, I mean, it was an early age. I knew early on that that's what I wanted to do. And, um, the journey was just, you know, typical, you know, finding guys on my street that had instruments and we, you know, do the garage bands. And, um, Mm -hmm. I was attending a Catholic, a Catholic, uh, school at the time. And, um, I didn't realize I was a worship leader, but I would lead, I would play my guitar (laughs) at the masses, you know, for the whole, the whole school and, you know, doing stuff from, uh, see if you remember this, Aaron, but Godspell, I don't know if that, that was a big thing back when I kid yeah and so uh, you know uh-huh. singing all the songs from that musical at, at our masses uh-huh. and uh, so yeah it just kind of it's kind of evolved there and um in junior high i moved to we moved up to davis and that's when i met uh that's when the, they had music in the school so i got into jazz band and uh met a uh, a longtime friend uh rick lauder who was, a, yeah. was an amazing drummer. Yeah, so Rick and yeah. I, we, I think we were each other's first band, you know, where we actually got paid to play um, at places. And, uh, wow. and so that's where I became a little more serious about uh, learning my instrument and um, playing with other like-minded mm-hmm. musicians, you know. So you started playing in church, huh? Yeah, I didn't really. I yeah, I did. <laughs> Not you know, unbeknownst to you. <laughs> unbeknownst to me, yeah, I just you know, I was the altar boy that could play the guitar. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Now, did so, you, were you were you any um in any like pop bands in Sacramento? Did you do any clubbing? Yeah. Um. Uh, yes. Um. Let's see. I. Um, I was in a group uh, called Beta, um, which was kind of a, um, I was, I was, I want to say, I think I'm pretty sure I was 15. And, uh, Mm -hmm. but these guys were playing in clubs in old Sacramento and uh, college, college dances at at Davis and Sac State and stuff. And so, um, uh, there was some really some really great players in there, Craig Fagnani and uh, Mark and Phil Toga and um, Alan mm-hmm. Hodge, and so would play there and did that club thing. And I might always have to sit in the um, in the kitchen in between breaks because I couldn't be out in the bar, you know, <laughs> out in the bar. <laughs> yeah, that's so, like that's was, a lot like me. I used to have to stay in the dressing room when I wasn't playing. Yeah. So, um, that was, yeah, that was fun. That was a great time also in, in Sacramento too, because there were just a lot of great bands that I would sneak in to go see like, you know, visions. And, um, uh, there was a group called Clancy that my real good friend of mine, Corey fight was in that. I just, oh, yeah. thought those guys hung the moon, you know? Corey fight. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, um, yeah, it was a really great time, and of course, um, did, you know, Brent didn't you and Corey and do? And yeah, didn't you and Corey do a lot of recording together in Sacramento? We did in the later years. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, Corey, and I would did a lot of stuff at Moon Studios with Dave Houston. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Corey was just yeah. I mean, he he was pretty big influence on me just in terms of um one of the first guys that i knew that could 
play everything, you know, as a songwriter, you know, so he would, you know, maybe he's one of the first guys to probably have access to a drum machine, but, you know, other than a drum machine was doing keys and bass and guitar and vocals. And it's like, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, big influence. Yeah. So you, so you guys probably did a lot of stuff with uncle rainbow and those guys. In the same I, circles. I um, yeah. I mean, I knew all of those guys, but I was still kind of, you know, uh, vehicle challenged because I couldn't drive. So, you know, it was like, I couldn't do a whole lot of hanging out with those guys. Um, they were a little bit yeah. older than I was, but I yeah. would, you know, try and I would follow them as much as I could. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember uh, when I got to Sacramento, uh, you were in, uh, you were in this great pop band. Um, people used to talk about that all the time. I, I don't think I ever saw you perform in that band. But I used to hear about you. It was almost like you were on the other uh-huh. side of Sacramento or something, you know? Yeah. That well, um, I, I put, I was, I got in a band. Uh, I was doing a lot of studio stuff, just demos of my songs, and the guys that would play on my demos, like Jim Caselli and um, mm-hmm. uh, Dave Maros and. Uh, Jim Damiano and stuff. They was, we decided to put a band together to play my original songs, and so um, it was called the Philosophist Band, for lack of a better name. Right. And right. Um, so we That's we would the band I we remember. would play. Yeah, we would play at the same time. Charlie was out playing in Bourgeois Tag, and um, we would kind of just all rotate the clubs, um, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. You know, it's just some great yeah. camaraderie at that time. And, yeah, um, a lot of people don't know that back in the day, man, Sacramento was like a big music town. I mean, you could play yeah. every night if you wanted to somewhere. Yep. Yeah, and there was a and there was a really strong uh, studio community as well, too. You know, so there mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff going on. It was a really great. It was a really great time. Did Dave Houston open the first studio there? Um, I'm, I mean, I, it's not the first, one of the first that really catered to music, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, he had the moon, moon studios out in South Sac and, um, man, that uh-huh. was just, that was a great place. I mean, I, I, Dave, yeah, there was, there was another guy that was just a wonderful engineer and a producer and, um, really helped me a lot. Um, and just kind of furthering my, skills and um and studio chops and stuff so that was yeah. that was a lot of fun now what uh at what point did you realize that it was it was songwriting and recording and just jumping into that because that doesn't always happen with people you know um yeah a lot of a lot of musicians they get into playing and playing and then somewhere along the way they go oh yeah if I should write some songs or something, but you seem to have like just gone straight to in that trajectory, you know, into writing and recording and that sort of thing. How, yeah. How, what do you, how was, do you explain that? Yeah. I was really fortunate. Um, when, when I was in, I think my freshman or sophomore year in high school, I got a job working at a music store in Davis and, um, they had an old, they had a, an old uh, TAC 3340, you know, the old four track reel to reel. And so the owner was a good friend of mine, Alan Hodge. He, we set up a studio in the back of the music, uh, in back of the music store. And mm-hmm. one summer I just hold, I, I literally spent the whole summer there, worked during the day. And then at night we recorded, I would write songs and then we would record them and watch and that were, you know, just, I didn't know if they were any good or not, but I just loved the whole process. And, um, I, at the end of the summer, I had a, I think it was a 12 song reel of songs that I had written and played everything. And, um, a family friend, uh, got it to Jimmy Webb and he, uh, 
called me he called me up and said, Hey, I really like this stuff and next thing I know, um I was I think I was like fifteen and, and I was signed to a publishing deal with Jimmy and um that's when I learned about that whole world, songwriting and mm-hmm. you know, um and it's like, yeah, that's I love uh, that's what I want to do. And so um, I didn't really want to play live very much because I just enjoyed being in the studio or writing and the whole creative process of that. So I just, mm-hmm. um, I made a beeline for that and, you know, just decided that uh, that's what I wanted to do. Wow. Jimmy Webb called you at 15. You were 15 yeah. years old, huh? Yeah. Wow. I'm not, I'm not going to yeah. tell the listeners who Jimmy Webb is. I'm not going to insult yeah. insult them like that. Yeah. So. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it, it was, it's pretty, his, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I, I still, to this day, I mean, I, I, the stuff that I learned just hanging around him and, and just the, just the gold nuggets that he would instill upon me about writing and how to write and, you know, the whole process. And I mean, it was just, man, it was, it was an amazing, amazing education. Yeah. Betcha. And you moved to LA for that? No, or... I was still, I was still in high school in Davis. And so right. they would, okay. they would, they would fly me down for a couple of days and uh, I'd hang out and show them my new songs and, you know, <laughs> it'd be like, well, not quite yet, you know, <laughs> but um it was really it was really great they i mean jimmy was very gracious and his whole his whole company i mean you know i i don't think they never i never got anything cut in the three years i was with them but um man they just really really nurtured me and um you know had a lot of belief and uh was very encouraging to to further you know to further my uh Mm-hmm. My walk in mm-hmm. music. Yeah. Man, I bet. Well, we're going to take yeah. a, a commercial break coming up here. And okay. uh, when we come when we come back, uh, we want to hear some Jimmy Webb story. Some of that wisdom. Give us give us a piece of that wisdom, okay? All right, folks, we'll be right back after we hear from our sponsors, Pitbull Audio and Studio Instrument Rentals. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on InterTalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Welcome. 
listening to Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge. With your host, Aaron the A Train Smith. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're here with my guest today, Mr. Phil Cias. And just before we went on that commercial break, he was telling us about uh, working with Mr. Jimmy Webb. So uh, I'm going to ask you right now, Phil, to to tell us a story or a couple of stories about being around Jimmy Webb and, and his advice and wisdom about songwriting. Um, well, the best advice he ever gave me was um, he would tell me, you know, to take, to look at the top 10 every week. So, the you know, the top 10 pop charts. And Mm -hmm. write the follow-up song for any one of those 10 artists. Mm. And that's kind of like the first year, that's what I pretty much did. So I would look at the, you know, top 10. And I don't know if it was, if Donna Summers had a song in there, I would like literally sit down and write what I felt would be the follow-up song for her, for that hit, you know? And so as a songwriter, it really got you in the mold of so much an artist, but getting into the, studying an artist and their hits and why they were hit and what made mm-hmm. them hit and then try yeah. and write the follow-up, you know? Um, and that was, mm-hmm. that was a really great exercise because it really forced me to dissect pop songwriting and, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what worked and from, not only from a composition standpoint, but also from production and stuff. So that's something I do to this day, you know, is um, as a writer, is, is learning how to study the artists that you're trying to get songs for, um, songs mm-hmm. too. And, and so that was a big thing. And, um, you know, just the other thing that he told me to do was read poetry. I mean, he was a huge fan or still is, of, you know, like Dylan Thomas and, and, you know, he really, really forced me to broaden my vocabulary for songwriting. Um, mm-hmm. And um, that was, that was really great. He told me, you know, you need to read the dictionary at least once a year. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> like, you know, these are words, <laughs> these are colors that you need to, that you need <laughs> to know, you know. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was it was really great, but he was, you know, it was just amazing. I mean, I, I, I have memories of going out to dinner and just having, just listening to him tell stories about Glenn Campbell and, or how this song got to this specific artist or working with uh, mm-hmm. Art Garfunkel when he did the Watermark record. And um, just, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just a brilliant, brilliant writer and, uh, uh, and craftsmen. So, yeah. Lot, now you've, you've also written with, you've also written with David Foster. How was that experience? Yeah. And, and how do the two experiences compare? Well, um, about, I think like in 2000, a, a really dear friend of mine, uh, who's a manager in Nashville, Mitchell Solaris, he, he, uh, asked me to help him put together a Christian boy band and do help with the auditions and everything. And I was like, I was very reluctant about it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. He goes, look, just help me at least as we're auditioning singers, you know more about singing than I do. And, you know, come on up to San Francisco. That's where they were doing it. And at least, you know, we'll have a, a, a good dinner. And I'm like, all right. So anyways, we, we put this <laughs> band together or we pick these guys. And uh, so then he goes, Hey, I'm going to need a song to demo. You know, can you, can you write something for him? I really want to keep it on the down low out here on the West coast. I don't want Nashville to know what we're doing. And I'm like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I wrote half of a song and I was stuck and he goes, well, I know this great lyricist that I'll connect you with. And that's Stephanie Lewis. So Stephanie takes the rest of the song. And of course she makes it great. And then we record this demo. And then I, with this boy band and uh, next thing I know, they're going down to meet David Foster because he was interested in them. 
And okay. so Mitchell goes, hey, do you want to come and meet David Foster? You know, come to the meeting, and at least you can meet David. And I'm, I was, um, I was just, uh, yeah. I mean, he he was a guy that I just, you know, he had so shaped my musical world. You know, I was like, yeah, I, I would just love to meet him. You know, so mm-hmm. we go down with the guys. He listens to them sing and listens to them sing the song that we do, and he gets done and he goes, "Who wrote this song?" And Mitch goes, "Well, Phil did." And like, he goes, man, he goes, I don't know what you've done in the past. I don't know who you are, but this is amazing. And, uh, next thing I know, within a couple of months, um, he signed me to his, uh, Warner Chapel division at one, four, three records. And I spent three years working under at one, four, three and with David. And, uh, it was like, you know, I, I mean, I, I I really feel like those three years it was an out of body experience for me because mm-hmm. uh, uh, just you know the, I remember the first time I went to Chartmaker his studios and I'm like okay I'm going to the Bat Cave now I'm going to see how it's done I'm going to see what you know <laughs> how 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 he does this and only to find out you know it's really not about the gear it's it's the talent I mean you know right I think right. he had a couple of couple of you know uh rolling jv 2080s and a sampler and a, and a lynn drum machine and was just mm-hmm. you know you know it's like they say it's not the car it's the driver and mm-hmm. and you just realize how brilliant this guy is and uh, so that was that yeah. was an amazing time and, um and the and plus the group plus one went on to to do you know really great in the christian world and um, mm-hmm. I had a lot of success as, as a writer and co-producing some of their work, and, um, and that was a that was a real fun ride. Um, mm-hmm. Now, were that, David Foster that. and were David Foster and Jimmy Webb uh, anything alike, personality-wise? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think focus. They were both very focused you know, on mm-hmm. what they were doing, um, mm-hmm. you know, and both, and both of them very generous. I mean, uh, you know, which I think is why they have had such longevity is because, uh, they, they, they opened doors, you know, and yeah. they under, um, you know, so, but I think focus, they're both so focused in their work ethic, you know, is, is um, something to strive for, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and never settling. I mean, I never, uh, I'd noticed David never, you know, never settled. Uh, and how he, whoever he was working with made sure that he could get a hundred percent out of them at all times. And yeah. that's something that I've tried to take with me, you know, cause that's, yeah. Whatever it is I'm doing now, yeah. So tell me, how did how did um, you start in the Spanish gospel music? Yeah, that's style. a funny thing how because, did... well, being growing up Mexican <laughs> in mm. Los Angeles, that helps. And my my family, yeah, it helps. And also, you know, my dad being in politics and really being active in the whole civil rights world with uh growing up you know with Cesar Chavez and and yeah. just seeing being a part of that culture um you know I've always loved that part of of who I am uh so rich mm-hmm. and the music and the emotion and food and the whole you know all of that yeah but I noticed as I got into Christian music um you know there was I think the the industry knew that there was this market. They just didn't know how to address it. And the main reason was there was a language barrier, you know? And so Mm -hmm. um, I, or whatever, and I don't, you know, I don't speak a lick of Spanish. That's what's hilarious. The rest of my family does. But yeah, when I was. (laughs) I thought about asking you that, but I went, of course he speaks (laughs) Spanish. No, no. Um, 
I just was, you know, I didn't want to learn and, you know, and part of it, though, my parents would speak in Spanish when they didn't want me to know what they were saying about me, too. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I kind of, you know, I understand it pretty well, but um, I don't know what it was, Aaron. I think I just felt like I knew their need. I knew that um, I knew what was going on in the churches in the Spanish churches and, and that they were being under-resourced with Christian music. Uh So I don't know. I just kind of opportunities fell in my lap to where I could really spearhead, um, taking contemporary worship music and getting it translated into Spanish and then, uh, identifying the Spanish worship leaders around the area and then later around the country and having them, on these records and it's just been Mm -hmm. like one of the most fulfilling and joyful things in my life to to be a part of something, you know, that's really somewhat bridging the two, the two cultures together. Mm -hmm. Now, are you producing original music written in Spanish as well? yeah, Yeah. So what I do is, um, some of the songs that I've written that are Spanish, I've, um, I'll write in English. And then there's some, I have a couple of wonderful translators that will take the English lyric and uh, translate them in Spanish so that they fit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's kind of how I write my Spanish music, you know, so. So what about what's um, what about the what about the rhythm of the language? How how the Spanish yeah, rhythm is yeah. different from the English? Yeah, that's why it takes a really good interpreter and a translator because it's not like mm-hmm. a you know a word for word translation. You know, there's a real beauty to the Spanish language. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm, I've always said the songs that I've written in English, when they get translated in Spanish, I think they, they just, they feel and sound and sing better in Spanish. There's just, Oh, um, that's cool. Just such a, such a beauty to that language, you know? And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's so rhythmical yeah. too. Yeah. 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 So. And, and, you know, I love it. I love it when the R's roll, you know, <laughs> I love that stuff. Yep. Gotta have a good R.O. <laughs> you know, I was in San Francisco so. when I first went to when I went first went to San Francisco. I went walking around, and there was a section of San Francisco. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's where all the Latin people lived. You know, yeah. Mexican, Cuban, everything, and. It was during the summertime, and people had their windows open, and I heard salsa uh-huh. coming out of the windows. Man, it it it, yeah. it really turned me around, you know, because I hadn't heard any yeah. stuff like that before, you know. Was, you know, I've been raised on Otis Redding and James Brown, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I hear this stuff going on, man, I'm going like, wow, and and I really, yeah. I really. You know the Cuban, the Cuban salsa. That's that. Yeah. It's it seems very energetic and very aggressive. You know, when I first heard it, it was like, oh man, this stuff is killer. And you got the timbaleros yeah. and the gunga players and and the rhythm of the language and the call and response and stuff. Man, I was like, man, I think I went out and just bought a bunch of records. You know. Yeah. And you know what's even gra- I mean, but what's even greater is with that music when you've when you've got when you watch the people that know how to dance to it. Oh yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, yeah. it's just you know so great. And well, yeah. you know, I don't know about you. I'm not gonna, but I cannot dance to save my life. And it's like, man, I just. You know, when you're sitting and listening to that music and you see people dancing and you're just like, ah, I can't do this. I wish I could, you know, because it's so, <laughs> it's so graceful and fluid, you know, but just to yeah. watch it is the thing of beauty, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, when I was when I was a teenager, uh, my mom 
rented out a couple of rooms to college girls from New York. We were in North Carolina. And uh, uh-huh. they were they would have these salsa parties, you know. Now that I now that I <laughs> yeah. think about it, they would have these salsa parties. That must have been like thirteen years old, and they pay, play uh, like Eddie Palmieri was like mm-hmm. one of their favorites, you know. Yeah. And uh, they used to try to dance the salsa, you know. They they used to try, <laughs> you know, but they used to try. It was okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's when that's, you know, thinking about it now, that's when I first heard about it. That's when I first heard it. And I think yeah. hearing it in San Francisco kind of revived that memory, you know, and and I was yeah. older and, and able to like go, oh, yeah, that, you know, and, and I've been playing drums longer. Well, when I was 13, uh-huh. I, was, I don't think I was playing drums at all. I don't think. But you know, I was playing drums now. So I had a relationship with it some way, you know? Um, and, yeah. and man, it just like ignited a fire. Love it. Love it to death. Yeah. Great. Man, I'm going to have to go play some salsa after this. There you go. <laughs> you have to come back to California. You have to come back to California to do that, right? <laughs> well, maybe to be understood. Yes. <laughs> so do you sell your, your does your music sell all over the world in spanish speaking countries um yeah i mean it's you know um i've been really fortunate i've had some great partners in terms of distribution that have gotten the records outside of the united states so in latin america you know in uh mexico and in um uh, El Salvador, and, you know, um, we've had, we've, we, we have product that gets down there and, you know, every now and again we get letters or not letters, but now with social media, you know, we get people that just, mm-hmm. you know, love the, are thankful and love the, love the stuff. They sing it in church or play it in church and, um, it's really, it's really cool. Yeah. Cool. That's great. All right, Phil, we got to take another commercial break here. And, folks, we'll be right back after we hear from Pitbull Audio and Studio Instrument Rentals. Play it loud. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on Intertalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Welcome. 
Welcome to Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge. With your host, Aaron the A Train Smith. Welcome back, everybody. Here with my guest, Mr. Phil Cias. And um, we're going to jump right into this third segment here. Uh, Phil, how did the altar boy worship leader become the editor of Worship Leader magazine? <laughs> well, it's um, so Worship Leader magazine uh, has this um, thing called song discovery, which is uh, this with every worship leader magazine comes a CD and now it's online, but of like 12 to 13 new worship songs from around the country or from, you know, Chris Tomlin or whoever it was. And I was brought on um, to kind of A&R and, and be the editor of the song discovery world there at worship leader magazine. And um, okay. so uh, that was a lot of fun. We would probably uh, every issue we w- I would probably listen to, I don't know, two or 300 worship songs in the course of a five week period. And we put together a, uh, we put together a panel of worship leaders from around the country and we would, uh, from different denominations, different sizes to kind of, uh, sift through all of those and see what songs we felt would really help the church in terms of new music. And so I did that. Uh, for about, I think it was seven years, I was uh, over there at Worship mm-hmm. Leader Magazine, and that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about mm-hmm. um, worship music and and and, and le- learned and met a lot of amazing worship leaders and writers uh, mm-hmm. around the country for the church. So um, I kind of stumbled into that job because I had just, I was at Maranatha Records their A and R director and I le- I left Maranatha and worship leader approached me and said, uh, hey, do you want to, you know, come on board and, and do our song discovery for us? And I said, um, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and there, and it was and yeah, it was one of those like, you know, didn't see it coming, but turned out to be just a really a really sweet time in my life, um, being involved mm-hmm. with all of that. For so, seven years, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So you also, you're, you're you're currently the owner and CEO of TSG Records and TSG Artists. Uh, yeah. When did when did you start that, and what was the impetus for that? Well, um, I started TSG Records about. Uh, boy, about 12 years ago. And the reason being mm. is I ran into, I met five brothers, um, Hispanic brothers, they're the Gutierrez brothers. And uh, yeah. I was at Maranatha, I was at Maranatha at the time. And they walked in the studio and sang, I think they sang the Star Spangled Banner or something. And I just, I just, one of those moments where I just go, this is the future of something. I don't know if it's for Maranatha. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, but I just, I, I mean, I just, I mean, I, lightning hit me. And so um, I tried, you know, I tried to get them a record deal and couldn't. So I'm like, well, then we're just going to do it ourselves. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> so I called up, you know, every, every favor I had, I called up, um, Jonathan Butler and had him produce three or four tracks from it and uh, I had uh, Jason White from uh, West Angeles do a couple of things and um, Mm -hmm. and I I think I did a couple of songs on this and that was kind of the startup of PSG Records and we were really fortunate got uh, a nice distribution thing from uh, Spring Hill Capital at the time and uh, so that Mm -hmm. started it you know, and I've been working with these guys ever since. Um, 
they're just they're five brothers that are now you know grown men and they're worship leaders mm-hmm. at different churches but they're still wow. they still come together as a family and uh you know they're they're amazing so yeah are uh, they here in the states called, yeah so they're they're all based okay. in southern california um okay and um so the guitarras and they're they're amazing i mean i love them and in fact, we just finished the. We released a new project, um, in August. That's out right now. What's it called? It's called You Terras, and okay. you can pick it up on iTunes or Amazon or Spotify, wherever you get your your music these days. Spell that. And, spell uh, that for us. It is G U T I E R R E Z. Gutierrez. Okay. Gutierrez. Cool, man. What else you got going over there in record land? And I'm, I'm land. working with uh, two sisters. So like the you, the whole, yeah, you have to be, you have to be siblings, I guess, for me to work with. <laughs> but I'm working with two sisters, <laughs> uh, Genesis and Nikki, and they're also from Southern California. And these two girls, um, you know, grew up their pastor's kids and they are, you know, bilingual. They, they grew up in the Spanish church, but they lead in English speaking churches. And so we're, we're in the process of finishing up their record right now, but we've released, I think we've got three or four videos that are on YouTube and we've released two, two singles right now. And I just think these two girls are amazing. Um, incredible people incredible women of God and great role models and great singers. Um, mm-hmm. So Genesis and the, 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 it's Genesis with two S's. So it would be G E N E S S I S and okay. Nikki N I K K I. And um, they're, they're wonderful. Um, so between Will this that, be that their keeps, first. Yes. Is this their, their first, first project? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, you were about to say, you were about to say between that and... Yeah, I mean, those between those two, and um, they, it keeps keeps me pretty busy. Um, mm-hmm. uh, also, I live, up, I live up in San Luis Obispo now, and uh, I have a, a church where I'm a worship pastor at, in Morro Bay, which is... Uh, oh. That's beautiful. Which is a there, lot of man. fun. Yeah, I mean it's it's great, and uh, we yeah. we don't have a consistent drummer, Aaron. So if you're ever thinking of coming oh, back, man, I got a spot for you. <laughs> oh, darn! What are you doing yeah. this Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm playing without a drummer. What I do? <laughs> I tell you what, you'll be my first call. Okay. Maybe yeah. my own, my only call. <laughs> oh so, man, yeah, that's some so of my a, that's some of my favorite stuff yeah. is playing in church. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. How many kids you got? Yeah. I have one boy. I have a a son, he's uh twenty two. He's finishing up his last year at UC Davis. And oh, uh cool. looking yeah, what's looking he, forward for him coming home for Thanksgiving. So what's he studying? He's um He's studying, he's a double major. He's studying genomics and psychology. So, wow. um, which is, you know, great. He's taken after his mom. He's got her brain and <laughs> he's really, really good student, unlike his right. dad. So <laughs> I was right. really glad that he, that happened. Does he play music? No, I mean he's he's actually very musical, um, but uh, you know he's a really great singer and but he just you know just kind of was really an academic as well and um, so I you know I, I didn't really push him. I figured if he was going to find it, he would find it, you know, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so. You know, well, none of my he's, kids he's took good. up the drums. <laughs> well, that's my young. I don't know if that's 
it is bad, yeah. <laughs> my my youngest <laughs> attempted, but she was wasn't really into it. It didn't last long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey man, drugs, you got drugs? you you've you you've done so much, man. It's it's amazing. You know, I, I pulled out your resume the other day, you sent it to me, and I'm kinda going, Wow, this cat's been busy. <laughs> you know? Are yeah, you it, are you like it, signing people? Are you still listening to demos to sign artists? I mean, how do artists come to you? How do you hear them? I I mean it's kind of um they get referred to me or I'll you know, stumble across them, you know, on YouTube or something, but you know, it's a, it's a real different world these days. And for me, um, I think, I mean, it's really about ministry. Um, Mm -hmm. I I love to come alongside of somebody that, you know, a doing it with or without a infrastructure around them, you know, that that's, they're called to do that. And, Mm -hmm. um, at this point, you know, I'm I'm really passionate about impacting the world through music, um, not only the church but the unchurched. Um, mm-hmm. and so, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things in play if I'm gonna, you know, step up to the the bar as it will, and you know, say hey, you, let's let's do something together. Um, mm-hmm. So. It's, not some, it's not something I'm I'm I've committed to both Guterres and Genesis and Nikki and it's a big commitment in terms of it's a lot of work. It's more work now than it ever has been just because of, you know, yeah. the financial diminishing returns in the music industry. But um it's it's never been more important, you know. So Right. Um Right. You know, now, are so, you involved yeah. in man in management too? Yeah, so with the girls, I'm pretty much managing their world in terms of lo- helping launch their record. Um, the Guterres brothers, they've been doing it forever. And, you know, if anything, I just kind of more of a mentor to them in terms of, you know, a sounding board. They've, they're have they really good at what they do, and they've got their finger on the, on the pulse of their ministry and what they want to do. I just kind of try and help facilitate ideas and dreams for them, you know, or put them in contact with mm-hmm. the right people that can maybe help, help get it mm-hmm. along, move along stuff. So, so people and they let wanting... me, they let me write for them. <laughs> so I'm oh, excited cool. about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, people can, are you open to people sending you material and stuff? Yeah, sure. How would they get in contact with you? Um, you know, it's real easy. I mean, I'm at philcs at gmail dot com. That's probably the easiest way. You know, mm-hmm. um, cool. and just you know, shoot me a note or a link of your something on YouTube or an MP3, and I, I'm all yeah, I'd love to listen to it. So, cool, man. Yeah, that's great. We're gonna try to have your information up on the the InterTalk Radio site as well okay contact info yeah um yeah because Great. um part part of this thing is uh getting people to know what the guests are doing now you know it's like an introduction and then it's like uh-huh. once, once you blow once you blow their minds it's like well what is this guy doing now <laughs> no. <laughs> no. hey man real quick i wanted i wanted to just say uh you know, when I was when I was in Sacramento, I mean, you and Charlie and I mean, you guys, I don't know if you realize, but the way you all lived your lives and through your music and through your faith really had an impact on me. And I know a lot of other younger musicians, not much younger, but, you know, uh, and, and that was that all, that always had an impact on me and that you could use your gift. Not only, you know in the pop world, but also there was, there was, you guys always made it a point to serve, you know, in the church and stuff. And that, I just want to let you know, that didn't go unnoticed. And it was always, that had a really big impact on me and made, 
what I wanted to do so much easier because I actually saw how it was being done by you guys. So uh, wow. yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was that yeah. was big how you guys would come out and go, we're Christians and we're musicians and we're, you know, and uh, that, that, that was a mind blower to me, you know, so. That's great, man. That's killer. Well, on that note, thank you, Phil, for uh, being on the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you, for your, thank you for your ministry to the church. Uh, everything you're doing here or have done has been pretty darn cool. Man. I'm proud to know you to friend. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Inner Talk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.